Welcome back to the Levity Zone. Join Al Lundell and yours truly, Dr. Bruce, for the next installment of our regular Tubcasts, recorded in Al's Hilltop Hot Tub on Future Peak, just around the corner from me in Boulder Creek, California. You will find that tonight's theme is something completely different here in the Levity Zone and in my personal life. Until this point, you've known me mostly through my gearhead nature, a creature born into the world of ideas. However, as I have aged and evolved in this life, I've become more interested in the human condition. That is, what actually makes people tick, beyond or beneath ideas. Silicon Valley, just over the hill from here, is caught up in a sort of a cult of gadgets, that tech is the solution to all of the world's problems. Such a gear-headed approach, while entertaining and compelling, is far from the reality of how the world really works. People are driven by fundamental, deeply held beliefs that are sourced in emotion and psychology far removed from daily gadgetry. We live in a time of opulence. Most people in the world have or are moving into lives where everyone can carry around a supercomputer in their pocket, the smartphone, and has access to better food, health care, education, and opportunities than any time in history. Far from being grateful and coming to peace and rest in this wonderful outcome of history, the population at large is racked by worry and lives in a state of dark foreboding about the future. An explanation of such a conundrum is that deep inside every one of us are processes that continually run in the background and, in the Buddhist viewpoint, create suffering. On top of all this, there is a segment of humanity who prey on such deep traumas for their own gain. These individuals, in turn, are driven by their own core programming, also a result of early life experiences. Science and the healing arts have, for the first time, converged around an understanding of these deeply embedded traumas, often installed during childhood. And the good news is now that we are finally able to read our own boot-up code to identify these traumas, their protectors, and tools are emerging to help us retool that boot-up code so that it doesn't drive us to distraction and disaster. This development is perhaps the biggest story of our times, bigger than any tech, widget, or political pronouncement. So without giving too much away, here is the first installment of what I am audaciously calling Healing Humanity. Yeah, it's been a happy camper. It's been a happy camper. So, hello, dear podcast listeners. This is a a Tubcast recording with... Al Lundell, a.k.a. Dr. Future. And a.k.a. Dr. Bruce. Mm -hmm. And a very happy evening. Uh, The spring is coming on. It's warmer. And Al has just brought up the subject of entropy and entropic states. I'm not an expert on this. You know, I'm more of a uh, journalist studying these things. But mm-hmm. one of <laughs> you know, so, but the advantage of my sure. position is that I get to see lots of different stories. Lots and of different stories. See what how the dots might connect in in unusual ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in this case, it has to do with entropy. There's a there's some popular theories now about why nature would create things like vortexes, like um, tornadoes. Yeah, why is that? Snowflakes. Um, Why? Uh, From my understanding, uh, or at least one theory goes, that these structures actually increase entropy. Like nature or Mm. the universe wants to go entropic. And so it creates these patterns to speed up the entropic process. Oh, okay. All right. So the uh, the idea there is that they will get more entropy out of the equation. So a tornado forms because the center is becoming more entropic, or well, it, it, it becomes a structure. It, yeah, it's for a while, but it moves a it moves a lot of stuff into a lower entropic state. 
Mm. You know, and, and it's a very controversial theory right now. I think it's Har Harvard. It's, it's Harvard. Uh, it's, it's not Harvard. Woo, not woo. No, it's not woo-woo. There's physicists behind it. There's mathematics. There's a lot of stuff that I, I haven't investigated yet. But I just thought I'd throw that basic meme out to you there, mm. Bruce, to check into, to look at it a little so, bit more. So here, this leads into another subject area, which was Ralph Abraham. Yes. Just hosted the Hip Santa Cruz Project Edition 2, Volume 2, with a new book. Right. At the Museum of Art and History on Sunday, and guess what happened for me in that thing? Well, let me see. I remember you being there, and you met uh, Fritzoff Capra. I saw that. Right. You saw me talk to Fritzoff Capra. Uh, yes. Is that who you're talking Fri about? Fritzoff. Fritzoff, yeah. Fritzoff Capra. So here's the cool thing. His book, The Tao of Physics, yes. which was published in the 1970s. Classic. Classic. I read that as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And along with reading about Einstein's thought experiments, this was also hugely inspiring. Mm -hmm. Because here is this guy, you know, as a graduate student or postdoc, sitting on the Twin Lakes beach and suddenly seeing, going into a state and not tripping because he, he noted that he hadn't smoked dope. Right, right. And, and he definitely hadn't done LSD. Well, he, he may have smoked dope. He said but he definitely hadn't done acid. Yeah. If he, he did, it would have been earlier in the day because he never right. smoked dope alone. Right. So there he is on the beach, and suddenly, because of his intention to understand the physics of the universe and to, to see, and because of his open state as a young UCSC postdoc or whatever he was, he started to see the vibrations and the dance of molecules in the air. Yeah. And then... A cosmic particle streaming in from space and hitting things and exciting things and because he was also studying Eastern religion and then he had gone to a talk by Krishnamurti who had come to campus and he and um, he saw this dance of all these molecules and particles and atoms and subatomic units yes and and, yeah. and considered that it was the dance of Shiva and that that uh -huh. that inspiration uh -huh. that, that Shiva creates the world through motion, through rotation. And that five years later, he put this all together into the Tao of Physics, which was a bestseller. And, right. And it was right. followed by the dancing Wooly Masters. Masters, right. Yeah. And then, which I guess would refer to this dance that, you're, that you just yeah, mentioned. Yeah, and so I knew they were all contemporaries, so I, I wrote a, a thank you note to Ralph. I didn't have Fritzoff of Capra's, Dr. Capra's email address. Hmm. But I wrote to... David Deemer saying this is what had happened mm -hmm. and copied in Nick Herbert mm. and that I had gone up to Dr. Capra and said I want to thank you for the book because it was inspiring for me as a young person and it actually led directly to my understanding of being able to go into nature and get a vision while in nature that would have an impact on science wow. and that I'd been working with Dave Deemer on The Origin of Life Mm -hmm. And I'd seen the cycling protocell system, the coupled phases, in such a vision, uh, directly inspired by Capra's writing. Mm -hmm. And Capra turned to me and said, oh, that's wonderful. And I said, do you know Dave Deemer? And he, he does, because they were in the same campus. Huh. And he knows Dave Deemer. And he said, do you know my colleague Luigi Luisi from Italy? Hmm. who I do know. I've met him at several conferences, and uh, he said, uh, uh, we're close collaborators. And on I, what? I, what are they collaborating well, on? Well, uh, Luigi Luisi did huge work on what's called autopoiesis, and this was even in the 60s into oh, the 70s, yeah. the oh, autopoetic systems. So I went to his website, I found his website, and I found that they have a new book out, and it's a really system theory approach to all of reality. Hmm which is exactly what I'm working on in the last two conferences, Science and Non-Duality and, and the Science of Consciousness Conference, where I presented yes. this, this three-phase cycle for the first time as sort of the explanation for the engine of creation that wound up into the living world, and but also creates consciousness and creates this field that we're in. But anyway, that's what Capra is, is doing. Uh, it's his second book only after all these years, but... Really? So he hasn't really done any publishing since the Dancing Wu Lee Masters? Well, he did uh, Tao of Physics. That was the first one, but right? I, as far as I can tell, I mean, certainly he did a lot of publications in physics. Hmm. But that's, that's amazing. That's another connection. I'll always look back on that 
with fondness that I actually was able to thank him and, and meet him. And he's been in Santa Cruz all these years, you know. And thank you, Ralph Abraham, for bringing him out to be part of his Yeah, that was Santa really Cruz. special. That yeah. now, now, where does uh, Copper live? Uh, Somewhere in Santa Cruz, I think. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe maybe over the hill, I don't know. Somebody nearby, though. Huh? Well, he's part of a, a project in Brazil. He's part of projects in Italy. He speaks Italian fluently. He must be Italian. Huh. Um, but, um, yeah, an amazing avatar of of the connection of science and mysticism, right? Yes, yeah, there was a science, mysticism, shamanism, yeah. the interplay of these um, Of these, these wonderful these people ways of, that yeah. have done this for us. And yeah. In some sense, Alan, I see this as my next task is to connect uh, mysticism and science, uh, to carry on that tradition that Capra was doing and that Einstein was doing and mm -hmm. not that I'm Copper or Einstein but I'm I'm in that tradition. Well it seems like you you know you have a good visual mind and and if it's switched on to this extent where you can do thought experiments yeah you know, then why not? I can know? do them I've done dozens of them exactly um, yeah and i mean it's can you but putting yourself on a beam of light you know the things that Einstein did uh, yeah i put myself in a in a protocell in the molecules, in the molecular storm, saw how self-assembly would work and how cell division might come about. Wow. You know, and there were many visionary experiences before that. But yeah, it goes on all the time. And say so, it's a natural th state for you, almost like you. It's a natural state. Like you have an, yeah. an endogenous, uh, um, normal. Yeah, and I, I have yeah. endogenous juices flowing. Yeah, through he me. has a normal state yeah. of awareness. And I, I recently yeah. met, uh, you'll be interested to know, um, I was out in, in Houston, in Galveston, for the yeah. for the Gordon Research Conference, where I was co-chair of the seminar. Mm -hmm. And I had the chance to meet Eric Davis's PhD advisor, Jeffrey Kripal, who's a professor of religion at Rice University. Huh. So I went to see him, and uh, we had a fantastic, delightful lunch at the faculty club. It's a private university, and it was so it was a good meal. And uh, we oh. talked for two to three hours, mm -hmm. and he may be writing about my story in his next book. Oh, uh, interesting. He writes about the intersection of science and spirit. He writes about all kinds of cults throughout history. and. Well, what's your thought on it right now? There appears to be a separation, but it's not really right well here's here's where i think the separation is if people go into story like yeah somebody sent me some link to some bizarre website that was just completely uh fantasy mm. the urantia vision of the 2000 the urantia books or the yeah and uh, it's like i looked at that in the first three lines it's like this is a fantasy this is like a made-up mental uh, web of fantasy that has no connection with the world at all, right? He says it's just somebody's uh, creation. It's yeah, it's the, complicated structures and everything, and yeah. and you you read the first two sentences, you're already you can tell. So those things. Well, I mean, you can say that about the Star Wars universe or Star Trek universe, right? But it's not uh, advertised as a uh, as, as an explanation yeah. of reality. Yeah. It's a yeah. it's story, but these things are advertised as somehow guiding people's lives. Uh -huh. You know, like. Scientology and stuff like that, or Mormonism, or for that matter, any Christian sect at all. So, as far as you're concerned, these are all just stories. They're stories. And they, they're getting people to buy into them. And yeah, it's all about power, it's about control, it's about resources. And getting it's people's resources. In getting your, people's in, resources. It's about extraction. I have a new simplistic theory of, of humans <laughs> yeah. that there are producers and extractors. Uh -huh. When extractors outnumber producers, civilizations crash. Yeah. Right? So extractors are real estate agents, lawyers, most CEOs, uh, investment houses, bankers, politicians, and people who put forward conspiracy theories, yeah, yeah, weird right. religious um, stuff. Well, I know it's a lot easier for people to extract money from me than it is for people to give me money. <laughs> and but for people to actually produce something new, yeah. produce value. Yeah. And this society is, mm. is burdened with extractors, right? It, yeah. They're everywhere. Well, yeah, it's a normal state, actually. Well, it wasn't the state, say, 50, 60 years ago, right? Pretty much 
everyone was in a productive position. Uh-huh. I mean, they either worked on a farm, which is productive, or they built things in factories, which we don't do anymore here. Now we know we write code and stuff, but that's why the society's in debt, $14 trillion. It's extractors have, have pulled that out of the system and out of the middle class. Mm-hmm. And so the extractors will ultimately crash the system. But you can literally look at someone's position, like someone who does broker deals with Bitcoin and then pulls money out. That's extracting. That doesn't produce value for anybody, right? It's, it's pulling out of a, of a ballooning value. It's arbitrage. Mm-hmm. But somebody who, you know, installs hot tubs is producing because they're bringing pleasure to people and health and, and they're selling products that other people can service. And oh, I see. Yeah, they're real, um, real tangible benefits to their actions to, to others. To others, yeah. yeah. So someone is a nurse, is a, is a producer, you know, dentists are producers, etc. If producers get outnumbered by extractors, we crash. But extractors don't want to make you think that they're producers, or they're not. Like Donald Trump has been a lifetime extractor, right? Multiple yeah. bankruptcies, wrecking other businesses, wrecking people's lives, you know, and he's... He's just doing that on a grander scale now. Huh? Yeah, and he's mm-hmm. a crazy extractor, so he's not even very good at it, you know. But Wall Street people are very crafty extractors, mm-hmm. and they'll balloon the system up, Mm-hmm. producing a false sense of value and then they'll crash it but they'll extract before they crash it right you know right yeah and to some degree people who mine minerals or oil are extractors you know they are producing some value but once the resource is gone the system will crash yeah it's a limited um, it's limited value. yeah yeah they even call them extraction processes yeah and they're they're ruining <laughs> land mm-hmm. and so anyways i don't know how we got on this topic but well, extraction, producers, and you say there's a balance between the two that needs to be maintained. What do you think that balance is? Um, well, I think that people who are predating on others' mental states or emotional states uh-huh. are particularly a toxic form of extractors. So those who are promoting weird religions or cultish kinds of things, because they turn humans that were producers into wrecks. So what about the startup business in Silicon Valley? That could be considered extracting or producing. Depends on what comes Depends out. Depends on the of business, it. I guess. Uh, but but yeah. somebody who's going around promulgating, you know, anti-science things or bizarre beliefs to create anxiety in the population through uh, separation. Through separation, and yeah. then they're making book. They're mm-hmm. signing people up for their program or whatever. Mm-hmm. Because they're they're actually reducing the ability of people to function in the world. So they make them terrified of chemtrails all the time. So then they, they end up having to have psychological help or medical help. Well, what I found with people like that is that they, that they believe the whole system is rigged against them. Right. And they're in their own delusional process. Right. And so they believe the fantasies and the mental constructs and all the things that support what they think is true yeah and they'll they'll turn it and twist it yeah so it's very very hard to reach those kinds of people and those kinds of people are very damaging to society mm-hmm. and as we see a rise in them this is their era right now the fake news era mm-hmm. and they they're raging they're having a field day because they're not only getting attention they have a platform it's not just the national Enquirer that people laugh about it's like everywhere yeah and 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 so the concern i have is you can just go back to the middle ages or the dark ages with these people you know if it becomes idiocracy you know (laughs) the powers generation stops and well well, that's kind of the origins of their belief system i guess it goes back to the middle ages yeah and and it's all based on fundamental trauma childhood trauma like we were talking about before yeah deeply held traumas that they're operating from So the good news in all this is, like what I'm doing now in this luminous training, is that that science and the healing arts, some of which used to be pretty woo, has actually gotten grounded, working together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Science and the medical and psychological arts have found the boot-up cycle, the boot-up code of humans. That the boot-up code of humans, not only is it genes, and it's, it's how you were raised, but it's experiences that you had even prenatally all the way up into teen years and say you had a traumatic or upsetting experience or an abandoned experience or an abuse experience like we're talking about yes 
then it creates these core codes that you will draw from when they're triggered. And so Donald Trump is an example of someone who gets into triggered some process, whether it's psychopathic or masochistic process or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it's deep, right? And it's trauma from his father, from his upbringing. Mm. And as a result of that, misery is dealt upon the world. So we all have to live out his reality. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. but the good news is we now have practices that can go in mm. and these are not pharmaceutical practices are they're very empathic practices they're very loving practices but they're very effective sometimes they're energetic sometimes they're touch you talked about rolfing starting starting yeah, like that. the um, many of these behavioral patterns are stored not just in the mind but in in the musculature in the body in the cells yeah. of the body that too cellular but for, and why is that? Why would the cells oh. store the trauma, do you think? Well, for instance, here's an example. One of the processes we've worked on in Luminous right at the beginning is called the schizoid process. The schizoid. Schizoid process. And this is a, a term from psychology. This is not woo stuff. It, it may sound wooey, but it actually is solid. Schizoid processes, say you had a cesarean birth or you, you were strangled by the cord... As you're coming out. As you're yeah. coming out, or you had some kind of early injury. Before you were verbal, yeah. before you could even lay down much in terms of memory. And what that does is it creates an escape route for people. So you can tell a person who's a schizoid because they're not in their body. Their body might be really wraith-like, very thin, and they seem to be somewhere else. They're like up here. Their consciousness has escaped. Mm. And... If they're triggered or under stress, they just leave their, their body. Yeah, they go to somewhere where it's less painful. Yeah. So to heal the schizoid is a subtle practice because it can't be done with words. It's going to be done more with the massage? The touch bringing no, in the body? In, in fact, no. Uh, touching them will send them straight into the air or the spatial Space. Because that's where the trauma yeah. was that somebody touched them in a way or something. Could and, be, yeah. or that the body was in pain, yeah. or so. What yeah. you find with those people is you find that they have a field. So all of us have these sort of shells and hmm. energetic fields that you can feel when you're in these states. And this is Reiki and Eastern healing arts knew about these for thousands of years. But for the schizoid, the field is far out from their body. Hmm. So they don't feel comfortable if somebody's in their space, right? Yeah, they don't like it. You have to actually touch their field very slowly and gently, if at all. And sometimes you just have to hold the space for them. Would you say this is on the autism spectrum as well? You know, it's hard to say. I, I don't think so. Well, I think that certainly a person on the spectrum has potentially some of this patterning as well. Mm -hmm. So this patterning... Uh, is an unconscious patterning established from childhood trauma, trauma events. Yeah. And, and so uh -huh. when, when somebody is rolling through the schizoid trigger, yeah. their body can start undulating from the core, from like the root. Huh. And their body will undulate. And we see this when we do our practices. Huh. And it will just start moving like crazy. Yeah, Reich got into that too. Uh, Wilhelm Reich, yeah, Wilhelm Reich. getting the body into undulation. Yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a sign of release. Yeah, which was important in the Reikian tradition, to release uh, their energy and get the undulations to go through the whole body, uh, ultimately. Yeah, ultimately. And so when we do this, someone will go through those releases. Sometimes they won't undulate at all in the schizoid, but there's six or seven other modalities or mm -hmm. other injuries. Uh, and people can be blends of these things. Hmm. One particular experience I had recently was I felt the person's field go up into space, kind of like this wind right now. Mm. It was moving above him. And then I stood back to feel up into the field. Mm. And it literally bounced off of me. It, it came into me. Wow. Like his conscious field reflected off of me and it traveled out. And it was so intense I almost like went down on my knees. It was just really intense. Intense in what way? How did, how did you oh, feel it in your body? Or? Oh, yeah, I completely. Yeah, it was uh, very energetically super intense, and I was almost nauseous. Wow. And so it bounced off me, because I knew it wasn't from me. Hmm. 
But when I looked back and I sensed back to the person, there was a membrane around their body, just tightly around their body, and I realized, aha, this is now the new boundary, and it's close. That means they're able to feel their body. So huh. I went in and did work as though he was now in his body, and we stood him up, huh. and he said, I have never felt this way in my life. I feel my body. <laughs> and we thought, well, what do we do? And uh, we thought, hey, push us. You know, I'll stand right here, just shove me. Because often schizoid people uh, won't touch anybody, right? They, mm -hmm. So that would be a, a strange thing for him to do. So he pushed hard on me. I said, push again, push again. Then I pushed back. So we said, strong body sexy body feel the body love the body he was like kind of starting to fight with us and it was a totally new experience like i am here oh. and we walked him to the car to go to the lunch and he was just in quite a state wow and this was after about a two or three hour roll that he'd gone through and of course the next day he's still feeling different but the patterning will come back and you'll start to do your natural escape from the world. So you come into a crowded room that's noisy, you immediately leave. You know, mentally leave or psychically leave. So his old patterns would try to reassert themselves. All the time, yeah. And, and so it mm. takes doing this over and over again with a supportive community Yeah. to, yeah. to let it land. And then doing other practices like, say, joining Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu mm. would help. But it takes many, many repatternings. And this is why largely psychedelics don't work in, in this type of work, because mm -hmm. they can open you up to cathartic release and you can see things. You can see entities and demons in your body and you can go through tremendous roles and feel amazing. But mm -hmm. it's a crutch because you had to bring in an external medicine and energy system. You then feel, well, I can't feel healed unless I take this. Well, what about the pathogens? I mean, MAPS has been working with that for post-traumatic yeah. stress disorder. The pathogens deal more with uh, the body. What's interesting, like MDMA, MDA, 2CB, yeah. mm. they actually create fundamental neurological, neurochemical reprogramming. It's astonishing. You know, in one or two sessions, even back in the old days when they were using ecstasy for marriage and family counseling and, and PTSD, you still needed a system of support around you because you still need a human system that knows you, sees you, comes around you when you get triggered. So a loud noise might trigger a veteran into PTSD. Yeah. And there's somebody there to catch them because if there's not, it then can they just, can, they can re-injure. Yeah, they, they re-stimulate that, uh, yep. that trauma. But the beautiful thing is it's the combination of these deep energetic healing work plus and pathogens, plus vipassanas and... Yeah, you use all the tools in better, the toolkit. <laughs> better food, dance, yeah. singing, all the toolkit. But the real deal is these deep energy work tools. They're the ones that can really land it, I'm convinced. Mm -hmm. And I guess also um, uh, your own awareness to recognize when these patterns are trying to reassert themselves. Yeah, and this is brilliant that you brought this up, Al, because you remember, we, we were old enough to be remember back in the 70s. Yeah. So in the 70s, there were all these encounter groups. Sure, and, I've been in many of them. <laughs> and, and remember primal scream therapy? Sure, yeah, yeah. So primal scream therapy, yeah. for the listeners, is people got in. They, they let that trauma or that anger or whatever come Just up. Just go with it. Just go with it. That was an amazing step in the healing arts but to just go with it meant that people couldn't heal so if you attach to the feeling and ride it out like a roller coaster yeah you'll come back exactly to where you were the roller coaster will come right back mm -hmm. whereas what's been learned in the last 25 years is if you get triggered and you create an observer position a viewpoint to observe it mm -hmm. become two people let it roll through but observe it, then you have a shot at healing it. But only if you maintain a distance from it. Let the body roll, let, let the voice scream yeah. out. And Jack Kornfield, yes. he talks about this, and he talks about his trigger being grasping. He didn't get enough to eat when he was younger, and his older brothers were all like, taking his food away. <laughs> so he will grasp for things. 
he will be in the cafeteria lineup at Spirit Rock and yeah. he panicked that someone's going to take the last dessert. Really? Right? Wow. And he's wow. the teacher, like he's the, the famous teacher, but he describes this to the student groups and says, when that happens, I take a step back and I watch the little entity, the little me, the little protector mm -hmm. come out and express itself. It, it's panic about not getting enough. Yeah. And it's grasping and he'll name the stages of that as that rolls through. Let it roll through, lovingly say thank you very much for helping to protect me again from need or from the pain of not getting. And then he'll put it to bed. And then he'll go on without being driven by the, the trigger or the grasping. But he says, after 30 years of spiritual practice, I still must do this. You know, but he's not ruled by his grasping nature anymore. At least he's aware of it and he's able to have some some sense of what to do when it, yeah. it ri rises uh, in his system. And, and that's what's called being a conscious person or an awakened person. Yeah, you're aware of behaviors. Now, I mean, do you think you know, that the behaviors are, uh, human behaviors are complex enough that they want to avoid being killed, you know, or stopped from existing, that they, maybe they have a certain... Yeah, they're... They a certain life, right? They, and they're, yeah, they do. Like simple little organisms? In Luminous, we call them protectors. So Yeah, so they, you, you personify them. You personify them. So what happens is, yeah. is somebody who suddenly starts screaming at another person, yeah. it's often that they've, in a sense, gone unconscious, and the protector has come up, taken over their system, and has taken over their voice and their whole body. Oh. And it's trying to protect them against the pain being touched by what that person could do or is doing, you know, inadvertently or on purpose. And the protectors can be really strong in people yeah. and do all kinds of absolutely mad and crazy <clears throat> things. And, and you can often have several of them. And what are they protecting exactly? They're protecting the wound that the little child got. And the, the value for protecting the wound is so that you don't get further hurt? Yeah. So, so for instance, a, a psychopath, say maybe you know, any person has a psychopathic tendency, a seduction psychopath. Uh -huh. Right, somebody who's very seductive and uses that to control people yeah. and get what they want, man or woman. Mm -hmm. Well, pretty much what happened to them was between the ages of, say, 12 and into teen years, they were abused sexually. Or some sexual thing happened mm -hmm. that confused the heck out of them or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they felt great pain. There was a, great, there was a wound, an injury done to them mm -hmm. that was around sexuality. And so they use sexuality to control others. So their protector is this very seductive thing that comes up to manipulate. Because it's trying to guard the being, the little being, from being hurt again. And it's a coping mechanism. So it's serving that little being, not the larger being. It's not the larger being. The larger being often is the victim, actually. Because suddenly they're being taken over and they may not really want to be a seductive personality, but it's just become woven into their personality. And yeah. it could be very limiting for their lives. It could get them into all kinds of trouble as it, as it does, you know, as that kind of behavior would. So that's another one of them. Yeah. And there's a, there's a half a dozen of these, and they all have different personalities. And do you learn to identify them yeah. as personality? Mm -hmm. yeah, can you can recognize their presence? From the, I, I guess, in the normal consciousness, you don't, you haven't done that yet, so they tend to be just a, a chorus of uh, Yeah, and it's, it's under the surface, but the people who run the luminous training and the advanced practitioners are so skilled that they can scan your system just by feeling you. Yeah. They don't have to talk to you. They can feel it and see it and feel it in their own body sometimes, what that's called somatic work, where you feel another person's system inside of you. And that's actually a where my skill set comes in, because if I open my system mm -hmm. and I have permission, I'll feel somebody in my system. I'll, I'll run a simulation of them. Yeah. And then it allows me to help them, because I, I am them. Can you, so you can feel their... Um, their blockages, their... their, their the, you can even feel their protectors? I can, yeah. Now, my level of training is such that I don't get a very sharp definition of it. Mm -hmm. But our leaders, they can feel the blends. A dominant protector or character style that is this, and then there's um, a couple of others. 
Uh, one of my first, uh, you could say, New Age trainings back in the 70s was a course called Silva Mind Control. Mm. And uh, one of the exercises they taught you how to do, which may have some relevance to this, was that you would create a workshop or a lab that had various uh, imaginary instruments in it that uh, tuned into these ah. things you wanted to look at. Like mm. you'd have a mirror for protectors, for example, mm. or a screen for protectors, and you'd scan someone with that. And you tell your brain you want, you want to sort your data through that screen, and your brain willingly obliges and gives you uh, information. Uh, so people, uh, surprisingly, uh, were able to have these screens where they could see mm. other people's um, wow. problems on them, even though they weren't tr trained medical diagnosticians. They're just normal people. So we all seem to have a certain ability to do that. Yeah, yeah. to tune into That's each wonderful. other. That's yeah. That's an early example of, of that. Yes, yeah, so you have a little lab where you create these imaginary instruments that tune into the things that you want to pay attention to. Because mm. we're such a technical-oriented society to, to create a gadget right. to do it, yeah, it, to create it makes, a, makes a it visual, real. A visual <laughs> visualization of something yeah. to create an instrument. Yeah, to just say I see auras doesn't really fly for a lot of now science was, minds. Did they go further uh, yeah. in terms of helping that person work through those, those things? Um, not so much. No, that that was more of a, the, the civil mind control was a potpourri of various techniques, that being one of them, hmm. to introduce people to their own power and to who they are. Oh, okay. Right, it's the, it was the beginning of the, uh, the crack in the cosmic egg, if you will. You know, I had experiences yeah. at Burning Man where I looked down inside myself ah. and saw my clockwork, how I operated. It was just amazing. And certainly in the jungle, uh, working with jungle medicine, I've sure, done yeah. that multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's amazing when you can look within and, and understand your boot sector, read your boot sector. Yeah, you see, that, 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 the fact that you can do that is amazing, right? Which suggests that we have some kind of built-in instruction manual. You know, and it's not written, and it's no. not an idea. It's got to be simple to use. Well, you know, anything complex, it's got to be simple. got to be simple Yeah, and putting your attention on it, I think, is how it's, is the beginning of and the, of the And having the, the subtle skills of knowing yeah. when you're going into thought and fantasy and story, and when you're actually you're, still here now, like what yeah. Ram Dass said, be here now. Recognize the difference. How do you feel now? Like, you could ask me right now, Bruce, how do you feel right now? Now. Uh, yeah, now. ask it. How do you feel right now, Bruce? Well, right, right now. Now no. that I'm out of telling this story for the podcast, <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> inside I feel really clear because huh. something very big happened today right. that cleared out a big part of my life. Huge. Yeah. While I was doing it, I was running around Santa Cruz and doing logistics. I, I didn't sort of have a moment to feel it, but. That's why I want to come here and be with you, because I know yeah. you would ask me this question, <laughs> and I would be able to feel this important moment. And um, hmm. and I do, and I thank you. Yeah. You know, oh, my pleasure, Bruce. It's my next phase in my life, and yeah. And thank you for asking. So that that's actually <laughs> grounding in like I feel really clear and really like young again in, in a way or brand new because i've never felt this way like i've never felt this brand new wow and in, in starting restarting and starting again like a reboot yeah <laughs> or like a re rebirth or a re rebirth? A refashioning a reassembly of me yeah you've reassembled I, your identity well yeah. i guess when you've been with someone for so many years you can't help but intertwine your yeah. your persona with theirs and in a way, I think for both of us, we can now peel us off each other. Yeah. So in some ways, I was stuck to my partner, and her, her yeah. issues were my issues. Yeah. And because I'm an engineer type, I'm always like, how do I fix this? How do I fix <laughs> this? How do I fix this? And because she was stuck to me, she was maybe feeling my judgments or my need to fix her. And so she was in her state. Her, the consequence of that yeah. and now we're free from each other and we still in a way love and certainly respect and appreciate each other yeah. but we had to unpeel ourselves from one another unstick yeah. and to, yeah. to feel this kind of lightness and to feel actually who we are 
you know, as humans. As individuals. As indi- yeah. Yeah, yeah, as individuals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's a big process. Wow. Yeah. You feel light because it's actually, you've now got the go-ahead to be yourself 100%. 100%. And yeah. um, that I'm not responsible for another person's um, process. Well, that's a big thing in our culture, you know, responsibility for others. I mean, people deal with that in, you know, as yeah. families. And, and, and yet, you know. I'm in a program to help others heal their process. But it's not that I'm responsible, it's that I will have skills to help them do the work. Yeah, because that's the only way it's going to actually that's, happen. Yeah, that's the only way it's yeah. going to happen. And when you're with a close partner, mate or spouse or whatever, yeah. it's really difficult. You can't be their healer. There's too many bonds and connections and threads. It ties and, in with yourself. Yeah, yeah it's so, too tightly tied Right, in. and everything that you say to them is kind of a mirror for you in some ways. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's too confused a field. And, and where a person you've met only once or twice, you can do really profoundly good assisted work with them. Right. Because there isn't that... That emotional attachment. That attachment and, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a simpler, simpler thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's great. That's a good direction. I'm glad you're feeling oh, lighter. Oh, and it's so much better. And yeah. you know, it's a pattern. It's, there's patterning, and, and and I have my own work to do. And I've been getting help from many people over the years, and more recently in Luminous, some of the advanced people have been helping me through my trauma, which was having no mother, no birth mother. Right, right, yeah. And, that's, and uh, coming out alone in the world and yeah, knowing and, I was alone. Yeah, and, and deep in abandonment issues. and Yeah, and, and so if what happens with me, my triggers of like like the Burning Man camp. Mm. Um, that's right. They, You took it to the point where you got re- rejected from well, them for a year, right? Well, no. Um, I did a bad thing. I made a bad judgment. And uh-huh. as a result, they disinvited me from coming to the camp. And mm-hmm. that created a deep trigger in me. You felt it. Oh yeah, abandonment, like so out bring of the group. Out, right. So that bring out uh, probably uh, depression. Well, yeah, just just yeah. everything. And so um, I worked through it under the guidance of another friend. I wrote a letter of responsibility. Yeah.